Okay, this video is called, is overtreated hypertension, the reason old people fall, are they demented? And so what this is about is, you know, I mostly work nowadays as a neuroradiologist. I still do a little bit of imaging guided surgery and I still do some general radiology, et cetera. But I see tons and tons of patients that old guy fell, hit head, you know, old person fell, hit head. That happens all day long. Every neuroradiologist has this experience. They go to the emergency room, they get a CT scan of their head, and it's rule out bleed. I had a friend who was a neurologist, this lady, and she told me that she wanted to help the patients that were falling, so she started a falls clinic, you know, to try to prevent the patients from falling again. And she said it ended up kind of being a joke. She said that it was really a dementia clinic. And the reason for that is, you know, what's the purpose of the brain? The purpose of the brain is to walk down a path in a forest, a jungle, or a prairie, and to survive. Okay, the, brain, the brain's much more devoted to movement than it is to thinking. You know, Voltaire had said, why do animals have brains but plants do not? Because animals move. So when a person starts, you know, having all these silent strokes of periventricular flare hyperintensities around their uh, cerebral ventricles on their brain MRI, it means their brain is being destroyed by silent strokes and by atrophy, apoptosis. Ap apoptosis more so than the silent strokes. I see tons and tons of this all day, every day. So why are these people falling so much? It's very common. They start to fall more often and become progressively more demented and then die pretty soon afterwards. So I see that as a major drop in the patient's health in that trajectory towards death uh, when these patients start falling. It's pretty routine. When somebody falls, you know, I always look for an old CT scan. It's very routine to see old CT scans over the course of the past year and the frequency of falls getting more frequent and then dead. Okay, so what I'm saying is you don't want to get there in the first place, and you're between a rock and a hard place with hypertension. Here's just an article from uh, JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association. Antihypertensive medications are associated with an increased risk of serious falls, injuries, particularly in those who had a previous fall. So if somebody's fallen and they're on antihypertensive medicines, you want to make sure they're not uh, being overtreated. You can also check a blood pressure on them while they're standing. You can compare their seated and laying down versus upright like orthostatic pressures sometimes that's relevant um so yeah obviously there's a lot of reasons why old people fall it's not just because of overtreated hypertension there's plenty of other reasons also once an article comes out like this it'll be <coughs> of concern to people who sell antihypertensive medicines so it's kind of like the nutrition business you know something bad comes out about soy all of a sudden the soy industry will publish a bunch of other things saying oh no soy is good and the same for other popular uh, profitable foods so basically with the brain you're between a rock and a hard place with hypertension and let me get this out of the, in the corner here um, because if your pressure is too high you run the risk that you can pop one of these lenticulostriate arteries and get a bleed into this area this is called the basal ganglia basal ganglia so the blood coming into high pressure can injure right at the origin of the lenticular stride and you get what's called a lacunar infarction, hypertensive lacunar infarction. But ischemic infarcts with no bleeding at all are like a thousand times more common than, um, hyper, than um, hemorrhagic infarcts. So that's the point. When the pressure is too high, <clears throat> risk of uh, hemorrhagic infarct. When the pressure is too low, you'll have a hard time. Where's the hardest spot to get blood? To the top of the head. So at the top of the brain, you'll have a hard time getting the blood up all the way around the cerebral convexities. And these are end arteries, many of them. And sort of this deep parenchyma often will be under perfused. This is the most common spot for silent strokes. Like in the periventricular white matter, it's called, uh, this is the coronal radiata level at the level of the cerebral ventricles. Just above that, it's called the centrum semiovale because it's in the center and it's semi-oval in shape. So anyways, this is the money. This is where I see tons and tons and tons of silent strokes every single day. Hundreds of them. One patient can have hundreds of them, and they just sort of slowly are deteriorating. Um, so now this is going to bring us to, okay, here's the hippocampus, the main site for memory, declarative memory, being able to say that is that, this is that, um, as opposed to like procedural memory is more of a cerebellar thing, even though they're a little bit diffusely distributed. Okay, so we talked about red blood cell blood cells being about seven microns, capillary about five microns. They have to deform a little bit to pass through. And when they're stuck together because of a high fat diet or because of stress with increased fibrinogen, acute phase reactant protein, then you got like this giant multi-level sandwich of red blood cells and the bridging molecule in between. 
And so then it's harder for them to pass through the capillary. Normally they deform kind of like a little, what looks like the little ghost in Pac-Man as it moves around. Um, and that's a parabolic tip. And the reason for that is what's called laminar flow. Normal blood flow is what is laminar. With the, the red arrows for red blood cells in the center, the blue arrows here for the white blood cells adjacent, and then the plasma um, farthest lateral running along the wall of the artery, the endothelium, the endothelial glycocalyx, if you will. And that's how blood flow should be with this parabolic uh, velocity profile. So when somebody is real hypertensive, the blood comes up at a faster rate, a higher peak systolic velocity, and it hits the median divider uh, harder because it's going so fast. So this, for example, is external carotid artery, internal carotid artery, going up into the brain. The carotid arteries are the main blood supply to the brain. And it'll bounce off this median divider, and then it'll be very uh, turbulent, chaotic flow, and there'll be some retrograde flow, often called eddy currents. And that slow flow confuses the endothelial layer into thinking that there's an injury, and it'll start to express prothrombotic molecules on its surface. And this is where atherosclerosis starts, you know, everywhere in the body at bifurcations on the far wall from the median divider. Okay, this is the classic earliest site of origin of atherosclerosis in the arteries of the heart, the coronaries, as well as in the artery, uh, carotid going up to the brain. All right, now chronic hypertension is also going to lead to thickening. Um, so here's a normal capillary up here, nor normal small artery, arterial, and you got this yellow for the capillary basement membrane or the arterial basement membrane. These are the red blood cells passing, you know, from this side to the other side. The little blue circles are the oxygen being given off by the red blood cells to the tissue. In this drawing, it's a neuron in the brain. So the point is down here, we've got uh, the situation with hypertension or diabetes. Thickening in the capillary basement membrane, hypertrophy and hyperplasia, increase in number and size of the vascular smooth muscles. And you can see there's fewer blue dots getting to the neuron. That means there's less oxygen uh, able to be released and make it from the red blood cell to the tissue, to the neuron. So the neuron is going to have less oxygen. It's going to be hypoxic. Hypoxia means less oxygen. And that's going to put the neuron at risk for programmed cell death, meaning death due to apoptosis, which means when the neuron has a certain metabolic rate up here, but it's not getting enough oxygen, it'll just die. All right, so that's how people lose tons and tons of neurons. Also, somebody who's chronically hypertensive, they're going to be chronically overstretching their ascending thoracic aorta in the, in the heart, uh, right above the heart in the chest. This is called the ascending thoracic aorta, the aortic arch, and then the descending thoracic aorta coming down here. And the point is that when you overstretch this, after a certain point, after 20 years of age, it can't recover anymore. And when it can't recover, what it means is you've, you've destroyed the elasticity in there. So it'll have less ability to maintain diastolic flow. That ends up being a problem for multiple reasons. Because less diastolic flow, diastole means cardiac relaxation. So normally the heart pumps and it stretches the ascending thoracic aorta out. And then when the heart relaxes, the elastic recoil kicks in and it pushes the blood, it propels the blood during diastole, cardiac relaxation part of the cycle. This effect is called the Windkessel effect, like the air things that blow air on the fire to get it started from the kindling. So anyways, the point is that chronic hypertension destroys the elastic fibers, and once the elastic fibers are gone, you can't generate good diastolic flow. So in order to, to generate the same net amount of flow, systolic pressure has to go up. And that's why people, the older they get, the more systolic hypertension they have, especially after 50, you know, they're going to have more systolic hypertension and diastolic hypertension becomes less of an issue. And that's a problem, though, because they're less able to perfuse their coronaries and other problems. But they're, they're more likely to have irreversible hypertension at this point. If it had been caught earlier, it'd more likely be completely reversible. Just briefly, the two major patterns of atherosclerosis, one is a so-called Western pattern, which is primarily from a high-fat diet, especially the coronary arteries and the carotid artery. This other type of atherosclerosis, sometimes called Asian atherosclerosis, and especially you think of it like in Japanese persons from the 1970s when they ate tons of sodium, like 12 or 14 grams a day. You know, you only need 200 milligrams. So they were eating tons of it. And they were also smoking a lot of cigarettes. So that led to hypertension-related atherosclerosis, which is primarily intracranial atherosclerosis and a lot of strokes. Okay, so here's um, normal blood pressure, let's say about 110 over 70. Here would be hyper, severe hypertension, 200 over 100. Uh, we talked about the RBCs having to deform, like fold back on themselves like a Pac-Man ghost moving around. Uh, they have to be deformable. 
Okay, the higher the cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, the higher the blood viscosity, meaning the thicker the blood, because LDL, <coughs> excuse me, is a bridging molecule. Six the red blood cells together. So here, <coughs> here we have a picture of a bridging molecule. Uh, fibrinogen, which is increased with psychological stress, also does that. Uric acid increased with too much high fructose corn syrup, too much meat. Uh, IgM antibodies with an acute infectious process that can also be a bridging molecule, meaning that it'll stick the red blood together, red blood cells together, overcoming their zeta potential, the negative charge on them, the negative charge on them, and that will uh, make the the blood more like a milkshake instead of like water. So pressure has to go up to pump a milkshake instead of water. Okay, so we talked about hypertension there. But now we got to talk about hypotension, meaning under pressure to the brain. And so this brings up the famous Jack Della Torre uh, experiments of tying off the mouse's carotid artery. Two months later, the mouse is demented. He does an autopsy on the mouse, and he looks in at their brain, expecting to see a stroke the first time. What does he see? An atrophic brain, ipsilateral, same side. <clears throat> they tied off the carotid. So chronic cerebral hypoperfusion from tying off the carotid. Della Torre figured out that that was the main cause of dementia in mice and we believe it's the main cause in humans, as well as, you know, my theory, the Rogers theory and neurovascular uncoupling, which I've talked about in several previous lectures. So anyways, you say, well, not that many people have an occluded carotid artery in their neck. Yeah, that's true. But tons of people have overtreated hypertension, and that'll cause chronic cerebral hypoperfusion diffusely throughout the brain. They also, lots of people have atrial fibrillation then you lose the atrial filling for, our, for the cardiac contraction. So that'll drop it, you know, as much as 25%. Depends on the rate as well, real fast. So they have even less ability to pump effectively, congestive heart failure. Uh, then there's other things that are, you know, different causes of dementia. Uh, but let's say uh, aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, post-cabbage hypotension. That means post-coronary artery bypass graft hypotension. All right, these are all some mechanisms of underperfusing the brain, okay, and they're going to cause cognitive decline and increase the likelihood the person's going to fall over and hit their head. Is it, by the way, this is so common, I don't even know. I, I A lot of times, I get an old guy history, and it says, rule out bleed. I just assume the guy fell down. Um, that's how common it is. <clears throat> Secret of hypertension. Um, it's easy for vegans. Everybody talks about high dietary sodium. Yes, that's true. But even more important and not widely recognized is lots of these patients have a low dietary potassium. Potassium is a vasodilator. You need potassium to open up those arteries. You need magnesium to open up those arteries. Potassium and magnesium come from plants. Sodium comes typically from processed food. And it's also used as a preservative and a flavorer in meat. You really want to have a dietary ratio of potassium to sodium of at least 5 to 1. Really, I think it's pretty normal to be you know, much more than that. I think our ancestors probably ate about 25 times as much potassium as sodium. And so you really want to be at a minimum 5 to 1. And a lot of that is based on the research that came from Richard Moore. He wrote that great book, uh, The High Blood Pressure Solution. Okay, and the reason for that is two-thirds of the energy in a neuron is used to run this plasma membrane sodium-potassium ATPase, or potassium-sodium ATPase. And what it does is it pumps out three sodiums and only pumps in two potassium. So more positive charge going out than in, and that leads to a negative uh, electrical gradient across the plasma membrane of the neuron, negative 65 millivolts typically. And that gradient, it's electrical, negative 65 millivolts. It's also chemical because there's a higher concentration of sodium outside the cell than inside the cell. And that means sodium really, 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 really wants to come in the cell. And that energy of sodium coming in can be used to pump other things out. And you need to do that. you got to get calcium out of the cell because it causes skeletal muscle to contract. It causes smooth muscle, vascular smooth muscle to contract. contracts all the arteries so that they're in spasm, if you will, and that means the blood is pumped through a smaller circulatory system, pressure goes up. And the other point I make is, well, why was the pressure high in the first place? Like I said, it has to be high to get to the top of the head. So when you drop that pressure, you run the risk of dropping the uh, ability to perfuse the top of your brain. So that's why one has to be careful about not over-treating hypertension. Um, in addition, these, these um, ions have to be kept in balance, the potassium and the sodium. And um, you have to do that because you have to maintain osmolality. So the point is, the more dietary sodium one eats, because salt on processed food most commonly, that's about usually more than 70% of a person's sodium intake, that will cause you to urinate out of your body your potassium. So you don't want that. 
because you're then getting the bad thing, the sodium, a vasoconstrictor inhibitor of endothelial nitric oxide synthase, and you're losing the good thing, the potassium, the vasodilator. And like I said, this, this whole electrochemical gradient, that's how your cell does work. Um, maintaining that electrical chemical gradient of sodium across the plasma membrane of a cell, that's how the cell pumps out calcium. Uh, this is called a knock exchange. I go into lots more detail in my other lectures. I'm just kind of giving a quick overview, so I'm not going to go into all the detail. It's also used for pumping other things, pumping protons, amino acids. It's, it's the electrical battery, the energy source of the plasma membrane. ATP contributes as well, but the sodium potassium ATPA is it's essential to good function of a cell. Okay, here is magnesium in the center of a chlorophyll molecule, so you got to eat plants to get it. You need the magnesium because... You know, an ATP, adenosine triphosphate, the energy currency of a cell, the $20 bill of a cell for getting work done. These phosphates have a strong negative charge on them that they repel each other. So the magnesium with its positive charge helps keep those phosphates from breaking apart. So you have to have magnesium to run all these ATP-dependent enzyme reactions, in particular the uh, plasma membrane pump, the potassium sodium pump, the KNA pump. Okay, then you've seen all these pictures before. The Tatahumata in northern Mexico eat their old-fashioned diet, a plant-based diet. They're skinny and energetic. They run 100 miles in two days. They're ultra-marathoners. The Pima population separated from the Tatahumata in 1848 now eat the sad diet. They demographically were matched originally, but now they're real fat and sick in comparison. Okay, if you look at uh, with the point I'm making here is it's always the same story. The old-fashioned plant-eating populations are skinny with normal blood pressures and no coronary artery disease, and the modern meat-eating, oil-eating, processed food eating are fat and sick. So the Yanomamo in Brazil and Venezuela, a part of the Amazon jungle, they only eat 200 milligrams of sodium a day, a primarily plant-based diet. They don't have any hypertension. Same blood pressure in teens and in their 70s. And then here's a story in Kenya. Everybody knows in America, blacks have tons and tons of hypertension. And what students learn in med school residency, oh, they're salt sensitive, there's not much you can do, it's sad. You know what, that's BS. You know, Richard Moore said, the problem isn't so much excess dietary sodium. The problem is primarily they eat a relatively little potassium because they don't eat enough plant foods. And they could dramatically have their blood pressure improved. If somebody's on antihypertensive medicines, don't suddenly change things. You've got to work with your doctor. And as you eat more plant foods, you'll probably be able to gradually taper down on your doses. It depends on how much baseline um, atherosclerosis you have in your, for example, your ascending thoracic aorta. If it's all calcified with no elastic fibers, it's going to be harder to improve your hypertension with dietary change. You'll probably improve it significantly, but maybe not completely to the point where you don't need any medicines anymore. That'll just depend on how long it's been that you've been hypertensive before you treat it and how extensive is the loss of elastic fibers in the ascending thoracic aorta, for example. Okay, so one of the things, too, I want to show you that I thought was pretty interesting. Here's a paper from 1929 in the Lancet Journal, author Donison, about hypertension in Kenya. 1,800 consecutive admissions to a hospital, not a single case of raised, raised blood pressure. So I thought that was funny. So their, their hypertension is not, not uh, a genetic thing. It's an environmental thing. Come on. So anyways, the, the, the reason I showed you this case was just to talk about I thought that paper on the idea of overtreated hypertension being a major cause of, um, of uh, falls in the elderly was interesting. Do I know for sure if that's it? No, I don't, of course. But it certainly sounds like it might be. And, you know, like I said, you're always stuck between a rock and a hard place with hypertension. Too high, you can intracranial bleed and get more atherosclerosis. Too low, and your cerebral hypoperfusion. So that's why you want to optimize your diet, exercise, and sleep. Um, and stress to the extent you can so that your body can just manage it itself because your body is a genius at managing your health in comparison with some pill. I, I, it always amazes me the way people trust some little pill more than they trust their body. Their body's been around for a long time. It's good at doing stuff. Uh, so anyways, I thought that was a little interesting.